Okay, we're talking about evidence for the Jewish tradition, and we're now talking about survival of the Jewish people. The claim that I'm making is that we have no natural explanation for the survival of the Jewish people. And I'm making the claim on the basis of comparing Jewish conditions of survival with the conditions both of survival and um, and loss of other cultures. My claim is that if you look at the way in which some ancient human cultures have survived, and the way in which the vast majority of ancient human cultures have disappeared, and compare the conditions, what you should expect for the Jewish case is that it should disappear, and it didn't. And very roughly, the argument goes like this. From ancient times, you have very few cultures that just survived, let's say, 2,500 years. And that's less than we've survived. But they tend to be the cultures of large, connected, and somewhat isolated populations, like the population of China or the population of India. We have a large land mass and a large population, and um, neither of them has large shared boundaries with other nations. India is a peninsula, it's almost completely surrounded by water. And three quarters of, Ch of China is surrounded by water. So if you have a large group of people and who are somewhat isolated, is there any reason why the, the culture should disappear? Why, why, if you were taking bets, will this culture last a thousand years or won't last a thousand years? I think you'd have to say, I don't know. <clears throat> but if you have a small population and it is in contact with many other cultures and there are empires in the vicinity which are very powerful, <clears throat> then you expect that small population to be affected by its environment. And if that population has ideas and values strongly uh, at variance with those in the environment, then you would expect the environment to have an effect on that culture, to cause it to warp and to uh, bend and to, to change and to adapt, so that if it survives under those conditions, then you have something which goes against general human experience. I pointed out that in the last 2,000 years, you have the example of the Romani peoples, whose conditions are somewhat similar to ours, and who were suggested to me to be a comparison, since they do still have a separate identity. But as I pointed out yesterday, they've lost their whole culture. They don't have any, any records of their history. They have no indigenous religion. They take the religion of the people they live among. They vary in their basic values, so that their, their, their culture really did disappear, which is what you should expect from a group of scattered minorities. And it didn't happen to us. So, it seems to me that comparing Jewish survival with the experience of the rest of mankind, there's no, let me say it carefully, we have no uh, plausible natural explanation. Now, here comes the parting of the ways. What happens when you don't have a natural explanation? Do you say, well, <laughs> The fact that we don't have it doesn't mean there isn't one. Let's wait another thousand years and see if one comes, comes up. I myself have said that in certain cases. Sometimes that's the right strategy. Why do the stars shine? For thousands of years, the stars were shining without any noticeable difference, and only at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, when they discovered nuclear fusion, do they have an explanation. And people just lived in ignorance. 
On the other hand, not always is that the attitude that people take. Up until the 20th century, the two natural forces that were recognized were gravity and electromagnetism. Those are the two forces that operate in, in the world, aside from where one thing that's moving hits another thing and moves it, where it transfers force. But these are, these are forces that create, create movement. Then at the beginning of the 20th century, they discovered that the atom, by the way, the word atom in Greek means indivisible. Poor choice of term, hey? Since the atom is made up of separate particles and the particles are made of particles and so forth and so on. But anyway, um, that the atom has a nucleus and the early picture of the nucleus is that it's a cluster of protons. Only later they discover neutrons. And protons are all positively charged. And the rule of electromagnetism is that like charges repel one another. So what are all those protons doing sitting buddy-buddy in the <coughs> nucleus? They ought to be repelling one another all over creation. And the answer was, and still is, that science claimed that it had discovered a new force, a brand new different force called the strong force called strong because electromagnetic repulsion is very strong, and this is much stronger than that. Wow. So, you have here a brand new force. Why didn't people say, let's wait a thousand years and see if we can figure it out without any new forces? Won't be in such a hurry. Maybe some genius will think up an explanation. Maybe gravity works when you look at it cross-eyed or, or left-handed or something. Who knows? They didn't say that, but they said we discovered a new force. So not always do you take the attitude, if I don't have a natural explanation, you don't jump to something beyond what you call nature. You just wait to see and, and, and try to figure it out on the basis of what you call nature. You don't always do that. Same thing's true in a much less exact, well-founded realm. I might even hypothesize that it's not founded at all, but that's another story. And that is in psychology, when Sigmund Freud invented the unconscious, which, by the way, Michel Salanter had discussed in detail decades before him, um, where a person does something and we say, he can't figure out why he's doing it to him, it's a mystery why he does it, but we say it's because he has unconscious desires. When people first heard that, they thought, that's just gobbledygook, unconscious desires? A desire is, is, is a motivation that makes you do things. And you do them. So, of course, you've got to be conscious of the fact of what's making you do it. Unconscious desires was a bold, radical introduction of a brand new idea, which up until then hadn't been used, and was accepted quite quickly because it did a good job of explaining the behaviors which we, we had difficulty in explaining. And people didn't say, wait a thousand years and figure it out with our old stuff. You know, with childhood training or, or, or money or something. Why, why jump into a brand new, unknown, and paradoxical idea? Because sometimes that's the right thing to do. So there's no such thing as a general attitude, general scientific attitude, never invent new ideas, new items, new forces, new entities, and rather just use the picture that you've had up until now. Scientific revolu revolutions often introduce brand new entities, brand new ideas, brand new forces, or brand new transactions or processes that didn't exist before because they explain things which you haven't been able to explain and because there's a sense that this thing's, this thing's really hard. It's really out of the box. You know, you have electro electromagnetism that's forcing the electrons apart. The other force that you recognize is gravity. Gravity is much, much, much weaker than electromagnetism. I'll give you the standard example. You have a nail on a, on a table, and you take a magnet, and if it's a strong magnet, when you get to a certain point, the nail will jump up to the magnet. You're familiar with this, right? Now think of this as a tug of war. The magnet's pulling up, and the whole earth is pulling down. And the magnet wins. Well, the earth's pulling with gravity, you see. <laughs> and gravity is very, very weak. 
And the magnet is pulling with electromagnetism. That's much, much stronger. So you look at this bleak landscape and you say, I've got electromagnetism which is pushing the protons apart. I've got gravity which is orders of magnitude too weak to pull them back together. It's got to be something else. It's got to be something else. It's got to be something new. Now, there are no precise rules when you opt for something new or when you say, let's wait and see if we can uh, figure it out on the basis of the old picture. There are no precise rules for theory change in, in science altogether. Philosophy of science has not been able to, to formulate any such precise rules, but there is fair agreement on cases. Even there, even there there's some disagreement, but there's fair agreement on cases. And that means that it is an option which could be justified to some degree, an option to say, no, this phenomenon needs something new. It's not going to yield to the old, the old um, explanations. Um, in particular, there is a kind of axiom that's used in historical studies, and anthropological studies, that people are people. And societies are societies, and they run on similar principles. Money is important, power is important, uh, physical attractiveness is important, and people go after the things that they want, and they make trades with people and agreements with people. But societies have, are, have basically the same dynamics. We have all, we're all human. And societies interact with one another and have affected one another, especially when one society is larger and more powerful than the other. Typically, the smaller society is affected by the larger society. <coughs> and all societies are equal. That's the axiom that they're using. Well, axioms don't come free. You don't get to just make up whatever you like and then, and then, and then uh, draw the consequences. If that's your attitude, go play chess. Don't pretend you're doing science. So here's this axiom. If you apply this axiom to Jewish history... I think you get clearly the wrong result. You have here a small population, a population that was never powerful. Wow, we once had a kingdom the, and the empire, the empire of King David and of King Solomon from the river in, 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 um, in uh, the, from the big river in, 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 in Egypt to the river in... Um, in the north, that was our kingdom. That had no comparison to the Egyptian uh, um, uh, empire and to the Babylonian empire, to the Assyrian empire, to the Greek empires, to the Roman empire. No comparison. So this axiom would tell you Judaism should be affected. You're able to see that in this century, Judaism changed in this, in this way because it was under the control of the Assyrians. And in this century, it changed because of the interaction with the Egyptians. And they were having wars with the Philistines, so it should have changed by interacting with the Philistines. You should be able to trace these changes, and then there should be no continuity in Jewish, in Jewish uh, culture. And you have a major population in the land of Israel, and a major population in Babylonia, and a population in Alexandria, and there should be no connection between those groups. Uh, they're under the influence of different cultures and different physical circumstances, and it should just go to pieces. You have Jews who lived in Poland for a thousand years, and in Yemen for 1,500 years, there should be almost nothing recognizable that they have in common, and it didn't work that way. Well, if your axiom, your methodology, when applied to a certain group, makes a prediction, and the prediction comes out wrong, then it's the wrong method. It's the wrong method. You can't just say, this is the way history is done. You have to justify the way you do history. I know, I know, it wouldn't be politically correct to say that this group is different from other groups. But it might be true. If you're stuck with political correctness, I just pity you, that's all. I just pity you. You're just living in a fantasy world. You might just as well be six years old. <coughs> so, is that disrespectful? Yeah, it's disrespectful. It doesn't deserve respect. Someone's trading truth, truth for political correctness doesn't deserve respect. Pity, maybe, but not, deserve, not respect. Anyway, so I think that um, the, the Jewish experience is one which doesn't fit that methodology. Now, could there be 
some other natural cause, which is operating in our case, and didn't operate in any of the other cases? Well, couldn't there be? Yeah, there could be. You know already that I give away possibilities. It's possible there are leprechauns also. But if you're talking about the cultures of, of, of mankind, and if you assume that this axiom that the academia is using does work for Australia and for, uh, uh, for uh, Africa and for North and South America and for Europe and Asia, then what you have is a certain kind of regularity in the way in which human cultures develop, and it uh, applies all over the world except here. Well, then something very strange is going on here. Something very unique. And I think that at that point, you know, I have good reason to think that it's beyond the natural. After all, different cultures all over the world have different physical circumstances <coughs> and different economics and different politics, and yet the general features of how they develop and how they change and how they survive are the same. And here it isn't that way. So I, I, I claim that we have good reason to look for something beyond simply the norm of, uh, of cultural development that people, that people uh, are used to. Now, the survival of the Jewish people isn't a new thing. People noticed it a thousand years ago, even 1,500 years ago. And in the last 500 years, it has been definitely a phenomenon that people are aware of and thought about and loosely made up slogans about the eternal wandering Jew and so forth and so on. The only thing they didn't succeed in doing is explaining it. Um, there's a four-volume collection of articles in Jewish, his, in Jewish history. I've, it came out uh, 50 years ago, but it was the most famous Jew historians, I think some of whom weren't Jewish. It's all about Jewish history. Uh, 2,000 pages, 2,500 pages. The question of explaining Jewish survival isn't mentioned there. It isn't mentioned. I thought that was quite remarkable. Um, everybody knows about it. People have talked about it. It means to say that the, the sum total of academic research doesn't have anything to say about it. Arnold Toynbee was a famous historian, and he had a theory of the rise and fall of civilizations and cultures. And according to his theory, the Jewish people shouldn't exist. There was a debate between Toynbee and I think Chief Rabbi Herzog. And when questioned about the existence of the Jewish people, Toynbee said, they are the fossils of history. Dead. They're dead. They're just mummies. They're fossils. Dead bones. Whew. Wow. That's remarkable. I think that's just a confession of bankruptcy. After all, fossils don't reoccupy their original state and, and create a new, a new state in the name of the old one 1,900 years later. Show me somebody who did it 150 years later. That's a fossil? It's more alive than you are. Then you take uh, Marxism, which also had a grand theory of how the world develops, and a grand theory of, uh, of the development of cultures, and at least one explanation, every grand theory has 12 different explanations, but at least one way of applying Marxism is, uh, is an economic theory. It's your economics that determine your culture. The feudal culture had a certain type of religion, a certain type of sport, and a certain type of economics. Because, <coughs> I'm sorry, a certain type of art, all because of the fact of the feudal economy. When you move to the, to the capitalist economy, then all the other features of culture are dragged along with it. And when you will ultimately move, as the iron law of historical development demands, to a socialist economy, that will change religion, it will change art, it will change sport, it will change everything else. The economy determines the nature of the culture. Well, as a matter of fact, 
Jews who practice traditional Judaism have lived under every economic system. And they remain faithful to their culture and faithful to their commitments. So Jewish history just doesn't fit that model. Jews lived under feudalism and pre-feudalism in the ancient world, and they lived under, under capitalism, and they did fine. As far as, as, um, as, as, as uh, socialism is concerned, in socialist countries that don't persecute them, they do fine. When there's active persecution, active persecution ha does have an effect. Uh, like 90% of identified Jews in the Soviet Union lost their identity in, in, in 80 years. So persecution can definitely have an effect. But that's not because of the economics of the culture. That's because they're chasing them and throwing them in jail. So again, you have a grand theory and uh, some plausibility was claimed for the theory in discussing the nature of civilizations and cultures and the development throughout the world, but we don't fit. That's, that's the typical thing. We just don't fit. We don't fit into these schemes. We don't fit into the normal explanations. So I think at that point, we have good reason to look for an explanation that is different from the normal, the normal explanations. Yeah? I just wanted to ask him, nowadays, concerning a few places with the Jewish society, with assimilation. Like, um, yes, well, there is widespread assimilation, but I want you to know that this is not new historically. Um, the Assyrians took off the 10 tribes, 10 out of 12 tribes, and although some remained and some, the population was mixed, so in the southern kingdom, which they didn't conquer, there were people from all the different tribes, just small numbers. Um, but, the, but the ones that they took off assimilated. Uh, in the, time, the Hellenistic period, in the Second Temple, when the Greek culture had a big effect in, in, uh, in, in the land of Israel, uh, a significant portion of people uh, um, assimilated into Greek culture. In fact, we talk about the Maccabees fighting against the Greeks. It was also a civil war because some Jews fought on the side of the Greeks because they had become Hellenized. So large-scale assimilation has taken place in the past. The shock is not that we have lost people to assimilation. The shock is that anything's left. In the ancient world, the, the vast majority of cultures disappeared to the court. Bottom line, total disappearance. They're gone. And um, the ones that survived, survived in isolated conditions, like I told you. <coughs> so according to the rule of human experience, there shouldn't be anything left. And there is something left, and it remains, it remains in existence. And that's why... It needs, uh, it needs a different explanation. Um, so, we have now the, um, the National Experiential Traditions, which we talked about the last few days, and yesterday today we talked about the survival of the Jewish people. Now, there's more, um, this is really a summary of my book, Reason to Believe. There's more, but I want to show you how we draw the final conclusion from this material um, because today is the day before Tanis Esther. Tomorrow is Tanis Esther. I won't we'll be teaching. Sunday and Monday are Purim. Tuesday, I don't know what's going to happen, whether it's going to be Shurim, if anybody's going to be in shape for, for, for Shurim. <coughs> Maybe if you listen to my Shur tonight, you'll, you'll be in better shape. You may be disappointed in the Shur, but you may be in better shape. And then Wednesday next week, I'm going to be out of the country till the following Sunday. So it's going to be a while till we, till we get back together again. Maybe next Tuesday, I'm not sure. I don't know what's going to do with me in Yeshiva. Do you have to tomorrow night? No, because my, my shear on Thursdays is only from 6.30 to 7.20. That's you know, from right after the fast. Um, so now, I claim that the existence of national experiential traditions and the survival of the Jewish people need to be explained by a power with certain features. And now, the argument that I want to make is in two stages. First of all, let's try to describe 
the minimum we have to assume about the power that's responsible for these phenomena, and then see after we have used the phenomena directly to give credibility to a power with those features, how far is the gap between those features and the rest of what the Jewish tradition tells us about the Creator and about divine providence and about history. So first of all, we're talking about the minimum you'd have to assume in order to explain the miracles which are national, national experiential traditions and uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish survival. Well, we're talking about, we talked mostly about the revelation of Sinai. And I mentioned a couple of times that this would apply to the plagues in Egypt and the crossing of the sea uh, in addition and eating the manna, anything that is a national experiential tradition and describes something miraculous requires some kind of supernatural force to produce it. What kind of force is that? Well, it has vast power. Uh, it can produce effects which don't accord, at least with the, the, the natural conditions that we understand. I don't know if we could rule out in principle some kind of natural explanation under the control of a, an intelligent power, <coughs> but certainly beyond anything that we understand. And um, it has obviously got a special interest in the Jewish people. If it causes plagues in Egypt where we are enslaved, and it causes the sea to split, the split so we'll be saved and our identities will be, will be uh, uh, destroyed. And uh, it produces a revelation for the Jewish people only. And it produces food that we eat for 40 years. This is uh, an intelligent power that has a very special interest in the Jewish people. Same thing's true with the survival of the Jewish people. The survival of a culture requires a certain amount of power to manipulate circumstances, but beyond that, requires vast, vast intelligence. After all, no culture voluntarily commits suicide. Just no culture. I don't, maybe, I don't know all of world history, but cultures typically don't say, let's give it all up and do something else. Um, people care about their traditions. They care about the way they see the world. They care about their values. They train their children in those values. That means there's a kind of collective effort in preserving the culture. And when the culture is lost, that means that collective effort failed. So that's a, a collective human effort using the intelligence and the resources that human beings have, and it almost always fails. Well, then if this culture survives in circumstances that are overwhelmingly stacked against it, overwhelmingly um, aimed at destroying it, then you're dealing with a very high intelligence, which can pull off that kind of phenomena. And again, of course, since only we survived under these conditions, that intelligence is invested in the Jewish people. Now, these descriptions that I just gave, um, a considerable amount of physical power and a considerable amount of intelligence, and an investment in the Jewish people, these are direct descriptions of the creator of the universe in the Jewish tradition. So these descriptions, I think, are verified directly by the historical record. You can't escape assuming a power that has these features. Now the question will be, okay, but the Jewish tradition has in it a lot more than just these features. Now I have more evidence on the basis of true predictions of events that, that otherwise wouldn't have happened in the, in the Torah uh, and the quality of life. I have other, other, other pieces of, of evidence which verify other particular descriptions of the Creator. But now I think we have to say that this, these descriptions are verified directly by the, by, the, uh, by the evidence. You get to the rest of the descriptions by the fact that <coughs> the Jewish tradition forms an integrated body of information. And when you have an integrated body of information, evidence for even a tiny fraction of it can count for credibility for the whole. Of course, 
The tiny fraction that's directly related to the evidence gets very strong credibility. The rest of it, which isn't directly related, gets less credibility, but it isn't zero. It definitely gives credibility. And I want to explain what I mean by integrated information. When I first presented this, these ideas, I got it wrong. And one of the students pointed out that something was missing. And I don't remember his name, but I appreciate it. I put it into the book because of that. Um, well, I want to take two extremes, where there's zero integration, where there's what I would call maximum integration. And then I want to claim that Judaism is in between, but, but much closer to the side of maximum integration. Let's take my favorite uh, whipping boy, and that's the New York Times. Now, if you read a page in the New York Times and you find it to be very accurate, does that give you any reason whatsoever to trust what's written on other pages? I don't think so, because the New York Times has in it many different sections with many different characters. Suppose you pick the stock page. It tells you what the stocks were last, yes, uh, yesterday and what so-and-so said about the market and so on and so on. Is that going to give credibility to the op-ed page? I don't think so. First of all, the stock market is open fact. You know, you can check it uh, on CNN. And what so-and-so said is also open fact. So you're dealing with straight, dry, sterile facts. The op-ed page, the person's making his observations about psychology and politics and economics and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, society and the rest, the first page could be very accurate and the second page could be absolute nonsense. Because the information in the New York Times isn't integrated. And this isn't a critique. A newspaper is supposed to collect together information of different types, of different levels, which is not an integrated whole. And therefore, the credibility of what's written on one page doesn't count for the credibility that's written on other pages. By contrast, let's consider gravity. There is a law of gravity, and the law is proposed to hold everywhere, every when, which means about 13.8 billion years of history, and given the expansion of the universe, you know, an expanse of, I don't know, 25 billion light years or something. <coughs> <coughs> it's supposed to hold <coughs> throughout in the same way, the same law. Golly, how would you know that? It's not like figuring oh. out the basic economy of Manhattan by asking six people, six residents. The amount that you're going to check, the number of observations you're going to make of gravity throughout the universe compared to the sum total of gravity in the universe is absolutely minuscule. How could you possibly draw any conclusions about gravity everywhere, every when? So Richard Feynman discussed this, and he said it depends upon whether your observations are limited or biased in some way. If you say... Oh, let's see. Let's observe gravity from 1992 to 1993 in Boston. Let's see how it works there. And then you say, and that's what it is, Alpha Centauri, and that's what it was 12 million, 12 million years ago, and so on and so on. People would say, man, you are really rash. One year in Boston, and on the basis of one year in Boston, you could conclude what it is throughout the universe? That's absolutely ridiculous. Even if you made 65,000 observations in Boston, it's ridiculous. Because there are only one place at one time. But that isn't what happens. You use astronomical data to estimate the force of gravity. And as you, of course, all know, the farther away thing is, the further back in time you're seeing what was happening to it. Because it takes time for the light to get here. So you can actually look back in time to check how gravity was working. And you can look in different areas of space. And if you pick your directions of observation ob uh, um, arbitrarily, without any, any pattern, and you pick the ones to study on the basis of their distance arbitrarily, some closer and some further away, and you always get the same value, 
then it's fair to say you have credibility. No, it's not 100%. Maybe it's not even 90%, but it's not zero. Not zero. You have credibility for drawing a conclusion about the gravity of the whole universe. What I'm, what I'm pu- trying to, to short-circuit here is someone says it's based on percentage. If you, do, if you, if you survey 20% of the electorate and draw a conclusion about an election, I could hear that. One out of five people, that's a lot of information. Of course, nobody does that. Nobody does 20%. It's 1% or half a percent or less. <coughs> but there's got to be some proportion that you're getting the information from to draw a conclusion about the whole. And if the whole human race for a thousand years would be measuring gravity, it would be zero compared to the universe. So you'll never have any enough, enough information to justify drawing any conclusion at all about the universe as a whole. And the answer that Richard Feynman is giving is that science doesn't operate that way, and your mind shouldn't operate that way. If there's no bias, if you're sampling generally, then you have a reason to draw a conclusion about the, the whole. Your reasoning is, if the whole isn't uniform, then probably it breaks up into different sectors. <coughs> And if I'm, not, if I'm not systematically limiting my observations, and I make a thousand observations, I should have hit one of those sectors where it's different. This won't apply to those who think that gravity changes over time. In a certain period of time, and then it just systematically changes, then you have to make sure you get to that sector where they say it was different. And say, the early universe, okay. But... The general idea is you're not, you're not defeated by the small number of, of observations vis-a-vis the gigantic area that you're projecting the, the truth on. Well, that's because it's all gravity. It's one law which operates in the same way everywhere. That's why a few observations can give you credibility for the whole. As against the New York Times, where it isn't one piece of information or one story or one methodology, it's many different types of information, each of which has its own methodology, and therefore what you read on one page may be completely irrelevant to what you read on another page. So in terms of, and again, I'm not criticizing New York Times this time. I have plenty of other criticisms to make, but not this time. So let's call the New York Times zero integration and the uh, theory of gravity uh, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, zero to 100, 100 units of integration. Where does the Jewish story stand? Well, the Jewish story is a story with one single consistent theme and then just applications of the theme. And that is, the theme is there's a creator who brought the universe into being and maintains it for a purpose. And everything that happens fits that purpose. The purpose is to be able to benefit the creatures that he's created. That's it. That's short that's one idea. It's reasonably uh, clearly, clearly defined in 12 words. Everything else is an application of that. Creation of the world and the story of Adam and Chava and the giving of the day of Torah Sinai. All of that is the way in which the Creator is implementing that purpose in running the world. When you have a single story a single theme, and just applications of it, I would say on a scale of 0 to 100, where the New York Times is 0 and gravity is 100, I would say you have a level of integration of about 80. Now, I, somebody says, no, it's 72. I, I'll give you 72. It's 84. I'm not, we don't have precise numbers here, obviously. I'm just saying it's weighted very much on the side of integration. And that means that when you find evidence for one piece of the story, it gives credibility to the story as a whole, because the information is basically integrated. And that's why I say, if you have national experience traditions where it's a power which has at its disposal certainly vast physical power, and it, and it uh, has a special interest in the Jewish people, and uh, the survival of the Jewish people where it has vast intellectual power, um, those are key elements in the Jewish picture. Now you say, well, that doesn't demonstrate that God created the world out of nothing. You're right. 
doesn't demonstrate it. But since it's all one story, and this is an element in the same story, it gets some credibility from the fact that these features are supported directly by the evidence. It gets some credibility. It's not zero. It's not the same credibility as the features that follow directly from the evidence, but it is some credibility. And that, I think, is enough to say that <coughs> with the confirmations that we get from the observations that we make, plus the integration of the story, that gives reason to accept the story as a whole. Yeah? So we have data of, I don't know exactly, probably the rough notes, the data of when the past, past 2,000 years we probably have data, and, and, and from that alone we can see how the Jewish people have survived through all these things as, as a nace. It's just a straight-up miracle, but when it comes to things like the Makot or the splitting of the Yamsu for the, you know, the Torah being given at, at Sinai, we don't necessarily have data of that other than um, Baal Peh, oral tradition, being brought down or being taught. So is that, is, is that something we can really analyze? Okay, so I don't know, you weren't here last week. You weren't here for the beginning of this series, right? Oh, that's probably you. Yeah, so those are what I call national experiential traditions. And I claim there's vast empirical evidence supporting the truth of those traditions. I spoke about that last week for, for a few days. Um, and the, uh, in one word, because I spent a few hours on it. Yeah, because yeah, uh, yeah, that's right, it's all recorded. Um, this, these traditions are of a particular type for which there are no known false traditions of that type anywhere in the world, not in China, not in Borneo, and not in Peru, and not in Alaska, not anywhere. People don't get this wrong. Human beings don't get this wrong. And that's good reason to think that these traditions are correct. So that means that these events really took place. And I'm just taking the next step from, the, if the events took place, what could be responsible for that, those events? And that's why I say it's got to be a power that's has resources beyond the natural resources that we, we understand, and vast intelligence. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to, to, to uh, 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 give rise to these, uh, to these types of events. So that's the general structure of the, of the argument which I present for um, the credibility of the Jewish tradition. Okay, that was like a two-day, five-day five summary. Uh, I wish the book were still in print. It may, may come back into print because you have to share I'm putting out a new book and with the same publisher. And he said, when you put out a new book, then often it's time to reprint an old book because there's interest in the, in the old book also. So that may happen. I'm not sure yet. Um, okay, so I'll, yeah, your question. So many miracles, and this is like that could serve the Parsha's proof for whole Torah story. But we could also say, make another hypothesis. He made this very, this very miracle just because Jews are lucky or smart, and they made up the story because they are smart. And miracle has a, and miracle has nothing to do with it. So we basically just replace it with another hypothesis and say Jews are smart and lucky. That's what uh, that's what happened. No God. Well, I think if you use that kind of methodology, you can cancel out all science also. Exactly, yes. uh, well, then it's not a good methodology, right? <laughs> so that means there aren't really any atoms, but he got lucky with his experiments, and uh, other people are smart, and therefore, uh, but there aren't uh, atoms aren't real. You know, if, you, if that's the way you can use that, that type of reasoning, I think that means that reasoning is not credible. Doing, doing 2, years of oh, what you see here, like in science, you have a, a cloud chamber, and you have you have uh, trails of of condensed lick of condensed water vapor, right? And you say a particle went through and did. Nobody sees the particle. Nobody sees the particle. You see the cloud, the the trail of, of vapor, and you say. You have a theory that says something went through and did it. Okay. The theory, theories are, are free. You know, you think them up, you can have them for nothing. But you don't, you don't see these things. Okay, but we can draw a certainty here, at least. Like we can say we, we will repeat the experiment 99 times, uh, 
100 times, 99 times, it will, for sure, the result will be duplicated. With well, actually, you know, with quantum mechanics, it won't be duplicated. It won't be duplicated. Everyone will be different. If you shoot an a, a electron or a, or, a, or a photon at a slit and you catch it on a, on a, on a, on a um, photographic plate behind, each one will land in a different place. And you'll have the, the, the structure of bands, which they talk about in terms of interference if it's a two slit. But each one lands in a different place. So you don't have exact rep repeatability. In fact, the point has been made. If you think repeatability of experiment is a key element of science, quantum mechanics isn't science because the experiments don't repeat. So it's, you know, all, in fact, there, were, there, was, there was people in philosophy of science who were against method altogether. In fact, Paul Feyerabend wrote a book called Against Method because he said when you impose a method on science, you're imposing limitations on what science can do. And we have discovered that limitations don't live long. Because you discover new phenomena and you have to think of new things, right? It was for a long time the universe was supposed to be without a beginning. That went down. <coughs> Causality, according to quantum mechanics, not everything has a cause. So that went down. Repeatability, that went down. You, know, you name it and uh, <laughs> um, it's uh, locality that all causation is... is, 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 is to something that's immediately adjacent. You can't have a cause here and an effect there. But the collapse of the, of the wave function violates locality. That's what Einstein was fighting with Bohr and company about. Not about, uh, about determinism. People get this dead wrong. Wonderful paper by Tim Morton on my, on my, um, my blog, reviewing uh, a couple of books in the history of science. And uh, Philip Ball, who wrote a book on quantum mechanics, got it right also that the this discussion there had nothing to do with whether there's probability or whether there's really causality. Problem was that when you do an experiment on the electron, uh, electron here and get an upspin, that determines that over there, that electron has a downspin. No matter how far away it is, instantaneously, it has a downspin. And that's action at a distance. And that's something which Bohr didn't answer in his famous answer to Einstein. And actually, Einstein won the argument, and Bohr didn't win the argument. And then John Bell's experiments uh, in the 70s showed he had a, uh, deduced the consequence of quantum mechanics. They set up experiments, and the experiments verify quantum mechanics against locality. So we have to say we deliver a non-local universe. So all these things, you say this is how science works, and this is what science does, and this is what science concludes. So that people, say people like Paul Feyerabend, you're just making arbitrary limitations, and they're short-lived. Their short life, you know, the half life is about 50 years. <laughs> okay.